All right, hello, hello, hello to you. My name is Roderick Chappelle. Welcome to Plant Based Homestead Prepper. Uh, today, normally I don't give you guys dates, but today is September 11th. And my heart goes out to all of the families of the people that were tremendously affected by September 11th. And I'm gonna tell you guys my uh, personal story on September 11th, so no intro needed today. My children were small then. <clears throat> uh, Gabrielle was three, Junior was two. Their mother was on the uh, USS George Washington at the time. I was on shore duty as a military police. The morning of 9-11, I was on patrol as normal. Uh, and fortunately for me, I didn't have any uh, any gate duty. And at that time, I used to listen to talk radio constantly. I mean, like, all the time. I got turned on to it by one of the guys I worked with, and it just stuck. It made sense at the time. And when the first plane hit, I was listening to, you know, listen to the radio, and they had breaking news. They was like, you know, we had a... We've had a plane to hit the blah, 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 tower in New York, such, such, such. I immediately went into base security mode. And I um, I called into my watch commander. I was like, hey, I don't know if y'all know about it, but a plane just hit the uh, trade, you know, trade tower, trade center in uh, New York. And I think we need to shut the base down. I don't, you know, I don't have any more details, but... I think we need to shut the base down. So, uh, you know, okay, all right, we, we, we'll check into it. You know, that's always the standard answer. We'll get back to you. Because nobody ever wants to make a decision that big. Nobody. Because that's, that's a pretty big decision. So, um, you know, can't remember how long it was. Seven, eight minutes later, they reported again. Another plane hit, hit the second tower. So I called back in. I'm like, hey. We need to shut this base down. Sure enough, as soon as I called in, I was calling my, on my cell phone at the time. Soon as I called that in, about a minute later, I hear on all the radios, you know, go to such and such. I can't remember if it was Alpha, Alpha or Delta. I can't remember. Go, go to such and such, such protocol, blah, 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 blah. And when we hear that, we know we need to, you know, take, take measures of shutting the base down, we go, we go get super armed. I mean, at the time we only carried, we was carrying nine Beretta nine millimeters. But uh, when that call came across, uh, many of us who were qualified, we ended up getting. Um, I think at the time we were carrying M4s. You guys know them as M16s or as uh, carbine rifles. And some, you know, some others who were qualified shotgun carried shotgun. So, you know, those, those small arms, we were, we were on to the T. And I went from to really basically enjoying my shore duty to literally hating, hating what I was doing at the time. My normal shift was from 4 a.m. to 4 p.m. I think I was working, I want to say it was three days on, three days off, or three days on, four days off, four days on, three days. I can't remember. I think it was three and three. Three days on, three days off. I went from that schedule where it was like awesome. Overnight to four in the morning, seven, eight, nine at night. And that day, <laughs> as soon as we shut the base down, that day, they stuck me at a place where I walked around a building, literally, for 12 hours. No bathroom break, no no lunch break, no nothing. That was eight in the morning. I walked around, I literally walked around that building <laughs> with an M16 with 90 rounds of 5.56, five, my Beretta 9 millimeter with 45 rounds. For 12 hours I had and I had no information I did not know what was going on didn't know how my family was 
didn't know my wife immediately uh, they were deployed to, to New York um, and it was it was probably one of the worst days of my life I didn't know the devastation and I didn't know the tragedy that had unfolded because of course I was walking around a building for 12 hours no communication no nothing just walking around a building when I finally went and picked up my children I wasn't in communication with the uh, babysitter at the time and I was like hey I don't know what's going on but you know I'm gonna be late picking the kids up I have no earthly idea what time I'm gonna leave work and when they finally let me off at 8 p.m. Now, mind you, I've been at work since 4 a.m. When they finally let me off of work at 8 p.m., I rushed home. Well, I rushed to the babysitters, got my children, tried to fix them, you know, some food or whatever, lay them down. And I guess it was probably about 10 o'clock at the time. I turned on the television. Because at that point, I had no idea of what was happening and what was going on. Well, I had an idea. I just didn't know. I didn't know the, the severity of it. I thought some planes hit the building and that was it. <laughs> when I turned on the TV at 10 o'clock that night and I saw the planes hit the building and when I saw those people jumping for their lives, well, when I saw them jumping to their deaths, I couldn't control myself. I started sobbing and I started crying like a baby, like a like a two-year-old. So much to the point where my children got up out of bed and my stepdaughter, which was uh, she was about seven. She got my daughter up, which was three, you know, and at three and three and seven, eight, you know, they understand that, you know, hey, dad is crying. And they came in there and they consoled me. <laughs> oh goodness. And I cried and cried and cried until the point I didn't have any more tears. Because I just couldn't believe. And at the time, I was brainwashed. I was. I was truly, truly brainwashed. I was military brainwashed. I was United States brainwashed. I was brainwashed. Um, and, you know, we can go into those details another time. But I was gun cold, ready to go to war against whomever. It didn't matter who it was. I'm a different man now. I'm a different person. You know, that's many, many years ago. But... Uh, the emotions are still there because you got to be a sad individual, a sad human being to, to see lives. <laughs> I'll tell you guys a story about yesterday. Yesterday I was in Lowe's as usual, per, per the usual, shopping, getting things I needed for you know to do my job. And I go down this aisle, I turn the aisle, and I immediately see this this thing I'll put it I'll put it a thing and, and you know and then once once I explain to you what happened you'll understand why I said that I see this thing in the middle of the aisle and there was a gentleman shopping you know he's on the same we were, we were um, shopping for lumber so I walked up to him because literally this, this thing was like seven feet from him I mean which is really close and you don't normally see this kind of stuff so I was like, I walked, I walked up next to him. I said, sir, I'm pushing my car. I said, sir, I said, is that not a mouse right there in the middle of the floor? He turned around. He looked, he like, it sure is. I thought it, you know, it was so still. I thought somebody was playing a joke. I thought it might've been one of those little, uh, rubber, rubber rats, I guess what they call them. I thought it might be one of those remote control mice. Cause you know, I got one. I have one of those. I play with the dogs with, with that all the time. Um, but it was sitting so still, I didn't I didn't realize it was a living creature. So the closer I got to it, the more I confirmed that it was a living mouse. And it was a little tiny mouse. I mean about about mm, that big. It was a little it was a, you can tell it was a young mouse. 
and he was tame. He didn't, you know, he or she didn't know that humans were a danger yet. I was able to push my cart right next to this this mouse. It never moved, or it never moved. I don't know what the gender was. The mouse never moved, and immediately I started thinking about this mouse's life because I know that some evil nasty person was going to come and stomp on that mouse. I just knew it. Or, you know, it's going to get run over by a forklift or whatever. And I grabbed my lumber and I kind of, I took it and I just, I was looking for one piece of lumber. So I took the, took the board and I kind of put it next to him and I kind of pushed it close to him like I was going to push him or touch him with it. I don't want to say hit, but I was going to touch him with it. And you know he, he moved and uh, went closer to where the uh, where the staging area is for the lumber, but he didn't go up under it. So I did it again, and I you know and finally the mouse went up under the lumber, and I was like you know it's not a good place for you. Now granted, I can't stand them when they come. You know we used to have a mouse problem when we moved in our into our house, and we would catch and we we caught and release all of them. Of course, some of them came back because I caught and released them across the street. So they was like, "Oh yeah, that was just a, that's a good little joy ride." So we got to the point where we would catch them and then we would take them like two, three, four miles away and release them. And I and I I started doing that because of my wife. She is such an animal's advocate. But it made me realize something. You know, being being married to my my wife, gentlemen, I, I've been married twice. Just so you so you guys know, and I got to free up some space so we can finish this. Okay, we're back. So I was telling the story about this mouse um, and my wife. And I've been married twice, so my first wife was not Jennifer. Y'all know, y'all know my wife is Jennifer. So um, you know, from learning from Jennifer that all life is precious, that life is sacred, and you have to do your part to make sure that. Life keeps living. My uh, my heart went out to that mouse yesterday because I'm like, wow, you're in a huge. I mean, because to to that mouse, the world was Lowe's. You know, it's just like to us, the world is the globe that we know of. But there's a whole vast universe out there that we will not see in this lifetime. And I don't really know where I'm going with this. It just, it took me back um, to 9-11. And I want to I wanna pay tribute to to the families that lost loved ones on 9-11. Today is 9-11. It's a day that changed our country forever. You know? And regardless of how you feel or think about 9-11 at large or as far as, you know, was it a government conspiracy? Is it a cover-up? You know, whether however you feel about that, 3,000 people still lost their lives that day. And it changed the country forever. Now I have my personal beliefs, which I'm not going to share. And I've done research after research that, you know, shows that those beliefs are valid. But it still does not change the fact that life is precious. 3,000 folks lost their lives that day. <clears throat> and that going forward and moving forward, we have to do what we can do in order to make sure that our families are protected. Why? I, that's why I prep. That's why I make sure that we have what we need. And, and we get such a bad rap. Oh my God. Preppers get such a bad rap. And all it is is just doing what the people who were 120, 150 years older in in history did. That's all we're doing. We're just going back to some of the old ways of life. That's all prepping is, y'all. And if you think or believe something different, then you're mistaken. You know, I remember coming up and you know going to visit grandpa, you know, grand, grand, granddaddy and, and grandma and. You know, my grand aunts and all that, they always had things that they needed. 
I remember I used to go up to uh, my Aunt Red on Courtney's house. That man has, he worked at the llama, llama yard. That man has so much just loose lumber. And they, they had um they had a whole, we call them crawl spaces now, but you know, back then it was just, your house was kind of just open. Um, he had so much lumber. And this man was like a master carpenter. I wish I was half of the carpenter this man was. And I remember this one time my mama said she wanted a, um, she needed a bookshelf. And I'm not talking about power uh, power tools. I'm talking about hand saw, nails, and a hammer, and a tape measure. And this man made a bookshelf that was like, I, 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 to this day, I have yet to see a, see somebody put together a bookshelf so amazing. Now, granted, that's simple, but to a kid, <laughs> when you're like six, seven, eight years old, and you're watching this happen, you're like, oh my god, that is amazing. How did he do that? You know. <laughs> but that's all prepping is: is just having the things that you need. And thinking about thinking about what could happen. Because I don't know if you guys know this or not. Winter is coming. And like the good book says, go to the ant and consider her ways. What do ants do? Ants work all summer long. They go out and they find different things. And when one finds it, I don't know how they do it. I don't know if you know, I, I've never studied ants, and I'm sure somebody can explain to me. But ants will get in a trail, and they go, don't, 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 don't. And they will go and go and go and get piece by piece. And I'm talking about this is so tiny, but they work together. And they get it done, and they do it all summer long. And in the winter, winter months, you don't see ants. You do not see them. They disappear. Why? Because they burrow so deep into the ground. They're like, hey, we good. We just going to eat and drink and be happy or merry or whatever ants do. And we have got to start doing the same thing. I always wanted an ant farm because I wanted to see how they did what they do. Because um, they're resilient little creatures. Okay? We have to be just as resilient. We have to be just as Yeah, that's the word, resilient. We have to be just as resilient as the ants. And we have to take care of what we have to take care of. So, I always try to leave you guys with something. I'm going to give you three quick, three, three quick tips, especially if this is your first time watching. Number one. And I was watching Barry Independent yesterday, and this dude, oh my God, he's got me to the point I'm like, I knew that one gallon per person per day was not enough. We're talking about water now. I knew that that was not enough now. That's like the bare minute. And I say, I tell you guys that all the time. I'm, I'm, I'm apologizing for this thing shaking like this. It normally doesn't shake this bad. I don't guess. Good gracious. Um, but one gallon per person per day is your bare minimum and according to bear and I and I'm, I'm I'm believing him and I'm with him you need five gallons you know because you got to consider washing and cooking as well so whatever you've been prepping as far as water minimum one gallon of drinking water per person per day and that's just that's just drinking water but you got to consider you got to brush your teeth got to bathe sometime you know and, and even it might not even be a, a full bath you know it can't be a full bath if if we're in crisis mode crisis situation looking at the chemtrails they already getting started um but yeah one gallon per person per day is the bare minimum and um you know you guys know i'm up in our preps to the point where we have, you know, we're getting to the point we have a minimum of three weeks of drinking water. 
you know, we got we got ways we can catch water outside and everything. I've been debating putting up a, a gutter system to catch water. Oh, but you know what? Prep for water, y'all. I gotta run. I'm running out of time again. I'm post this video and then we'll come back and see you guys on the next time. Okay. Thank y'all so much for being here. Please subscribe, hit the bell icon, and uh, comment. Please comment. Okay. See you guys next time.